here we go, section 5.2, part 1. Today we're getting into more transformations of sinusoidal functions. Let's get into this. What are the purposes for this class? We want to know the characteristics of sinusoidal graphs. We did a little bit of this already. We're going to continue with that. And of course we want to graph. Always graphing. Never ends. So we are dealing with displacements. So displacement, we're talking specifically about vertical translations. So this is going to be the D value if we're looking at A, B, H, and K. Um, yes, I know. It should be A, B, H, or K. This is technically supposed to be the K value. And this is written as both a D or a K. You'll see it written as both and I'm just messing with you to keep it as D for now and not K like you've seen before because you'll see it both ways. So I want to kind of throw you off with that to say it doesn't matter if you put K or D, it is both the same thing. So let's graph something. So we've got sine X plus three. With this, we've got a vertical translation three up. So therefore, we just take our original sine x graph and move it up three. So we take this from last lesson, and this is what it looks like. Now I put some dotted lines in here because I want to specifically talk about these points. So in the middle, we have at y equals three, this is our midline. I didn't specifically talk about this in last lesson, but I wanted to point it out now. This is what the midline is. So it starts at the very center. So partway between the, the maximum and the minimum, that's your middle. So that's the midline. And we have some equations here for the maximum value. So the, the point at the very top and our minimum value. So D being our vertical translation, plus or minus the amplitude, this gives us maximum or minimum. Where this is helpful is if you don't have a graph you're just given the equation and I ask for, say, the range or I ask for the maximum or the minimum. You can calculate this without having to actually graph it out. So these are some important things for you to note about maximum and minimum. And from this graph specifically, we've got a range of two to four. Again, if you wanted to look at this, um, we could calculate this. My D value is three. The amplitude is one. So three plus one gives you four. Three minus one gives you two. That's where your maximum come from. So let's try a, another example of this. Let's say that I got cos X minus six. My, uh, I'm just determining the range of this. Sorry, I'm not graphing this. So my D value is negative six. That is the value at the very end. Amplitude is one because my A value is one. So if I want to get the range of this, first I need to know what's the maximum, what's the minimum. So I take the D value, I take the A value, and I could just solve for what each of these are. D plus A gives you max, D minus A gives you minimum. So there's my range. I just get that from max min. So the minimum value is negative seven, maximum value is negative five. So that's how easy it is to determine the range. If you have an equation, you don't need to graph it. You just need these equations. Not too bad. Now we're looking into the next type of transformation. So we're looking at phase shift. This is the same as a horizontal translation. And again, here I put C, You've seen this before as H. This, they're the same thing. Depending on what textbook you use or what website you're on, you will see them both. So it could be X minus H. It could be X minus C. Same thing. Don't get thrown off by that. It is the exact same thing. Let us graph this function. So y equals cos X minus 60 degrees. 60 degrees automatically tells you if I'm in degrees or radians. That's the nice thing about C. It tells you, are we in degrees? Are we in radians? Um, first thing we can calculate, you don't have to, but we could, is uh, figuring out the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is always when x equals zero. 
And in this case, y equals a half. And again, as we've done before, if we want to graph this out, I need to know how to space out my points. And to space out those points, I am now not just going to take the period divided by 4. That worked when we had no phase shift. Now that we have a phase shift, I need to take that a little extra step. So I need to find the GCF, or the greatest common factor, of my C value, the phase shift, and the period divided by 4. So greatest common factor of these two values, plug in what C is, plug in what the period is. So the period's 360, we have no B value, so that doesn't change. So this is what is the greatest common factor between 60 and 90, and the greatest common factor is 30. So this tells us how we split up our x-axis. I split it all up into 30s, and then from there I can graph this well. So 30 is how we split it up. The p over 4, which is 360 divided by 4, which gives you 90 degrees. 90 degrees tells you how far I put the different points. So going from middle to max, it's 90 degrees that I have between those. But I need to get this greatest common factor so I can also include that phase shift of 60. Uh, so this is just what I said. So the division on the x-axis is 30. Again, that's the greatest common factor. And each point that I make, and you'll see it on the graph, is 90 degrees apart. Um, which, of course, when I graphed it out, I didn't put the points. Um, but let me, let me describe this in words. I phase shifted 60 degrees to the right. If you look at your x-axis where 60 is, that is my starting point. So up there at 60 and at the y equals 1, that's the first point. If I go from 60 and shift over 90 degrees, I'm now at 150. There's the midline. I go over another 90, I'm at the minimum, negative 1. I shift over another 90, I'm back at the midpoint. So this shows you how much you need to uh, rotate or shift um, your points. So they're at 90 degrees apart is where you'd put each of those points. Let's try another example. Now I'm going to combine every single transformation that we have done. So I've got y equals 3 cos of a half x minus pi plus 5. So from this, immediately, if you look at the c value, it says pi. So as soon as I see that, I'm thinking radians. My, my graph has to be in radians. And whenever you're graphing something like this, Here's your strategy. Pull out all the characteristics you can find first, then we graph. So looking at this, my midline of this sine function or cos function is y equals 5. And that is because the d is equal to 5. So that's something that's automatic. My amplitude, so the difference between my midline and max or midline and min, is 3 because the a value is 3. So, so therefore, since I have an amplitude of 3, and I have these equations for maximum and minimum, I can just calculate the maximum is 8, the minimum is 2. So that gives me a few more characteristics to deal with. Looking at the horizontal shift, we've got a horizontal shift of pi to the right. And again, this is because the C value is pi. The period, we just take the period is 2 pi over b. Since b is a half, we've got 2 pi over a half equals 4 pi. And uh, because of this, we know that my graph, my cosine graph, is going to start at pi. Because it's a cosine, I start at the maximum, or the top which is y equals 8, we figured that already, that's the maximum, and it's going to finish 4 pi later, or 4 pi to the right, because that is what the period is. So I start at pi, if 
I add the period, which is 4 pi, I get the end point, or the end point of one full rotation is 5 pi. Now the last thing we need to do in order to graph it, we need to figure out how I'm going to split apart the x-axis. And as you recall from before, this is just looking at the greatest common factor of c and the period divided by 4. So here we get the GCF. GCF of pi and 4 pi over 4, which simplifies to pi, so that one's an easy one. My greatest common factor is pi. So that is going to be how we split apart our x-axis is into pi increments. So it's taking all of these things together, my midline at 5, amplitude of 3, which gives us max and min, taking the horizontal shift, the period, all that stuff combined with how I've split it apart into pi, this gives us this graph. Here you can see the specific points. So typically my cosine graph starts at the maximum on the y-axis, but I've shifted pi degrees to the right. Then, after pi, pi um, value, we're moving to the right and putting the next point, because that is the period divided by 4. That tells me where the next point should be. So after pi, I get the midpoint. After pi, I get the minimum point. After pi, I get the midpoint. After pi, I get the high point. I am starting to get hungry because I keep talking about pi and it's making me hungry. Okay, so this is how you would graph that out. The steps for this are all the same. It's going to be the exact same process. You're going through this. Look at all the characteristics. Figure out how to split apart your x-axis. Plot these five points the key points to be able to get this going. Now on to the next example here. So we want to graph this equation. I've got negative sine 6x minus 240 degrees minus 2. The first thing with this I need to take a look at is factoring out the b value. Hopefully you remember we had to do this. If you don't factor out the b, it's going to mess up some stuff with our graph. So make sure you're always factoring out the b value. If there's something in front of the x, immediately factor it out. The other thing we can note with this is that we are dealing with degrees instead of radians, because it says because uh, my c value is in degrees. So let's look at some characteristics. Midline is at y equals negative 2, since d is negative 2. The amplitude is 1, and I also have a vertical reflection since a is negative 1. So therefore, I get the max min, get those values. I'm assuming by now this should be pretty easy. You have that equation d plus a, d minus a, get these values, pretty straightforward. We've got a horizontal shift to the low. It says left, it should be to the right. That is a mistake, and I need to change that. And we're back. Okay, I switched it. That's how quick and easy it is. So, horizontal shift to the right, since C is 40, it's not to the left, it's to the right. And uh, the period, we take 360, because we're dealing with degrees, divided by the B value, which is 6, we get 60 degrees is the period. And so, therefore, from this, we can get that I start at 40 degrees with the midpoint. We're starting at the midpoint because it's a sine function, sine mid. And we're starting at the midpoint. We already figured that out. That is negative 2. That's the midline. And we are going to finish after a full rotation. So I start at 40. The period is 60. So 40 plus 60 gives you 100 degrees. That is where the finishing point is. Then we need to split our x-axis, finding this greatest common factor between c and the period over 2. We figured out c is 40. We figured out the period is 60. 60 over 4 is 15. So the greatest common factor between 40 and 15. If you don't remember, greatest common factor just means what's the biggest number that can divide into both of those. I didn't explain that. Don't know if you understood that before or not. But it's what's the biggest number that can divide into these two numbers. 
So the biggest number I can divide into both 40 and 50 is just 5. That's the biggest number I can divide into both of those. So that tells me how I need to split apart my x-axis. So given all this information, we can put this all together and make this fine graph here. Now, not every single point is 5 on the x-axis, but those little lines in between are my 5 points. So you'll notice I've got 1, 2, 3, 4 lines in between 0 and 25. That represents 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, till I get to 25. So it is split up, it just doesn't show every single point. So there you can see my five key points. I start at 40 degrees, as I promised, and we finish at 100 degrees, as I promised. Those are the five, locations, five key locations. And you can see I went from the midpoint and went down. That's because of the vertical reflection. So I needed to flip it instead of going midpoint up, I went midpoint down. That's where that reflection comes in. Um, and that is, that is that graph. So let's try getting a equation, an equation from a graph. So here's a graph. We want to determine what is the equation for this. Now we need to try and work in reverse here and try and figure out what are the characteristics on this graph that give me my A, my B, my C, my D. Once I have those, I can make the equation. So what do we notice? First of all, let's assume we're dealing with a sine graph. And I'm going to assume that because on my y-axis, I'm actually starting at the midpoint. Since I start at the midpoint, I know that has to be a sine function. If I were to start at a maximum or a minimum, that more directly correlates to a cosine graph. But it's easier if I just start on my, my y-axis with a sine. Here's the trick with this there's an infinite number of equations that could make this graph. It all depends on your phase shift. And I can, I will explain more about that later, but I can make an infinite number of equations that fit this graph. And that's how this is a little bit confusing and very difficult to mark on a test because there's a whole whack of, of answers you could give for that. Um, so I'm gonna say this is sine and a vertical reflection since I go downwards at the starting point. I notice that my maximum value is at positive one, my minimum is at negative seven. From this, I've got two new equations for you. The D value and the A value I can get from this. And this is really just a rearrangement of the equations I've given before, uh, but I give them again to you specifically here. So to get D, let's take my max and min, add them together, take the average, that gives you negative three. The A value is the difference between max and min divided by 2, which gives me 4. And you can verify that by looking at the graph. Y equals negative 3, that's my midpoint. From that point, I go up 4 to get to 1. I go down 4 to get to 7. Not too tricky there. Now I just need phase shift, and I need my, uh, what's the other one? Phase shift, and my vertical translation. No phase shift. I start at the midpoint. Sine starts in the midpoint, so I haven't shifted left or right. And to get the period, I'm going to look from not midpoint to midpoint, because that's really only half. It's the amount of uh, x till I get to the full rotation. So here it is 8 pi over 3. So therefore, I'm going to plug this into this equation. b is equal to 2 pi over the period. Um, Think but previously we did the period equals 2 pi over b. We just rearranged that for b. And here is my b value, 3 over 4. From this, I get my equation. I have a, I have b, I have c, I have d. All I need to do is now simply put it into this equation. So you notice here, I switch between h and k and b and, and c and d just to get you comfortable between flopping between these things. They are the exact same thing. And this is my final equation. Could I have made a different one? Yes. I could have said my phase shift is 4 pi over 3. Then I would have a normal sine graph with no vertical reflection. 
I could have said my phase shift is 2 pi. Then I start at the max. That's a cosine graph. So you can change between sine and cosine and reflections based upon my phase shift. And this just takes a little bit of practice to try and find what you're more comfortable with. I always look for midpoints and signs. That's just me personally. If you love the maximum points because that's easier and you want to make a cosine graph, that's totally fine. It, it really doesn't matter which one you are going for. There we go. That is the first part of uh, 5.2. We will continue on with this. I will show you a very specific case with sine and cosine graphs and graphing those. But next time we'll just get into some more practice with this since graphing cosine and sine functions is a little tricky and trying to figure out the equation is tricky as well. So I will give you a little bit more information on that for the next video. Okay, so this next video that you need to try and guess, or the next movie you need to try and guess, um, is a lot more basic. I've been told that the last one that I did was way too easy, but we'll see. Um, so, my description for another movie that I really like is a guy who really likes to steal shiny things, steals a shiny thing. Good luck trying to figure out which movie that is. I'm assuming there's going to be more than one, but try and figure that one out.